There exists on our planet a land blessed by nature, a country where the rich, fertile, and well-watered soil has given birth to an exceptional wildlife. This country is France, and you are going to discover it as if for the very first time. What is this large deer looking at as the new day dawns? A territory filled with extraordinary nature, a land which by its diversity has attracted man for thousands of years. The animals living in these climes have fabulous adventures to recount. But they're not part of another world. We men and women share their lives. They struggle to survive, combat one another and make peace. They choose their mates and deploy all their strength to raising their young. They transform themselves and acquire unsuspected powers. They travel long distances. Some men protect them, others care for them, and some even form alliances with them. From the highest mountain tops to the ocean shores, here are the secrets of this country, the outstanding destinies of these little known animals and the men and women who live in contact with them. A fascinating journey into the secret land of Wild France. Our story begins in the high mountains. At first glance, everything appears calm, but a closer look reveals a survival zone. Animals and plants are engaged in a race against the clock, a struggle to resist the harshness of winter. Animals here are clothed in a layer of fat and a coat of fur that enables them to resist the polar-like cold. They sleep for six months, lowering their cardiac rhythm to one beat per minute and reducing their body temperature down to four degrees Celsius. To take advantage of the sun for as long as possible, plants begin to blossom under the snow, and where spring arrives, everyone emerges from their shelter. We're in the Pyrenees mountain chain, home to the continent's most powerful animal. The brown bear is a force of nature. <coughs> Just out of his den, this huge solitary beast has one vital need, to devour everything he can get his paws on. He hasn't eaten anything for months and has lost a third of his weight during the winter. The bear's vision isn't very keen, but he has an incredible nose, capable of smelling food from 10 kilometers away. His sense of smell has detected a dead wild sheep beyond the summits. To satisfy his appetite, the bear can travel several kilometers every day. He's the marathon runner of the mountains. In the spring, his diet requires an abundance of protein and the sheep will be perfect. This is not the time to think about anything else. But what's that underneath? Earthworms will make a wonderful snack. Not enough to restore any reserves of fat, but tasty all the same. And now, off for the sheep again. A protein diet is all well indeed, but there's also fruit. 
The vitamins in fruit are good for the health. And now for the main dish. No more stopping. What about ants? Their protein. The problem with ants is that they itch. They crawl under the fur. There must be some termites under this bark. We've got to deal with the ants first. Well, just a quick stop to clean up, and a trout passes right between the paws. Now, that's hard to resist. And besides, the soft flesh of the fish is full of calcium. Good for the bones. But what's that? Raspberries. Sorry, too tempting. The technique is a bit tiresome. But each mouthful deserves to be savored. Mm. Agulme spreads the seeds he ingests in the mountains, unknowingly participating in their biodiversity. Mm. After living in the French mountains for a quarter of a million years, the bear almost disappeared in the 20th century. But the good news, he's back again. Mammals represent a third of the bear's diet. And if by chance he attacks a domestic herd, it's because they're easy to catch and because the bear doesn't know that such meat is off limits. The old folks tell children that if they run into a bear, they should speak politely to him, since the animal has a gift for understanding men. If you come across one, don't run. Just walk away as naturally as possible. To the east, the Alps rise up, forming a 1,200-kilometer mountainous arc, a colossus that controls the climate and maintains the water reserves that irrigate the plains. We're in the Akan National Park, 150 summits surpassing 3,000 meters and 10,000 hectares of glaciers. This territory is a realm of a legendary animal, the Golden Eagle. people have decided to devote their lives to preserving this ecosystem. Among them, one such man has been roaming these mountains since his childhood. Christian is impassionate by everything that lives here, although the golden eagle has won over his heart. Every year he tracks them by finding their nests, determining the number of youngsters, and making certain that the conditions will allow them to soar through the skies for a long time to come. The first animal breeders settled in these mountains 5,000 years ago. The eagle has lived here for 300,000 years. He's very possessive of the territory he occupies. If another eagle tries to enter it, he attacks, and the combat is merciless. He is capable of killing the intruder. During his ascension, Christian crosses a number of different types of terrains. From the bottom of the valley to the glaciers, it's as if he were traveling from the south of France to the polar circle. Each sector has its own plants and animals. Three kilometers of uneven land that reveals as much as 3,000 kilometers of the planet. Their only common element is this water that the mountain expels into the valleys. Following the torrents, Christian has discovered a small bird with unique abilities. 
The dipper feeds on small aquatic mollusks that live in the riverbeds. As strange as it may seem, it is capable of diving into glacial waters. No other bird can move under the water as well as the dipper. It swims with its wings. To feed its young, it dives down to a depth of two meters and remains there in apnea for 15 seconds. He does this several times a day. The mountain altitudes inhabited by man stops here. At 1,600 meters, a new world begins. The huge forest of conifers with large trees, pines and spruces a terrain reminiscent of the Siberian tiger. The eagle prefers to create his nest at the edge of the forest. But finding it is no mean feat since the imposing bird is extremely discreet. Be sure to keep your distance, since the animal, although strong and powerful, is afraid of us. The king of bird is fierce. The eagle's hunting ground is higher up, where trees are more rare, where the terrain opens up to his piercing eyes, where grass reigns supreme. On leaving the forest, we cross an area the Christian calls the combat zone. The tree's branches fall to the ground exhaustedly. Pain for those who dare. The alpine grass takes over, a terrain that resembles the tundra of the Great North. Since prehistoric times, to flee our hunter ancestors, the marmot has taken refuge in these high prairies. To go about their daily activities, marmots have developed a collective surveillance system. Sentinels take turns to guard duty on their colony's territory. In this way, they can raise their young in peace and spend their time playing and living together. And even more outstanding, they have their own language. From a distance, they can indicate to the others the nature, the proximity of any potential danger. A repeated whistling signifies that the danger is approaching. Be on your guard. A short whistle means everyone take cover. During the time Christian has been observing him, the eagle has become accustomed to his presence, and sometimes a miracle can take place. The eagle's eyesight is eight times superior to that of man, and his field of vision is 300 degrees. Nothing escapes his sight. The eagle gains high altitudes in order to choose his prey. It's a bitter law of nature, but without marmots, there would probably be no eagles. The final step of the ascension, the summits. On these vertiginous slopes, we sometimes hear the sound of falling rocks. It's the chamois, 
whose refuge is vertical. The eternal snow and the glacier resemble the polar circle. One would think that nothing could possibly live faced with these elements, but that is not the case. Usually the snow is white, but in the spring it can be pink. This is due to algae which flourish in the snow. And what do they feed on? Water. These microscopic particles color the snow. It's the blood of the glaciers. The Mercontour Massif is further south in the Alps. An important event has taken place in the bowels of the Earth. During the first days of April, a birth has been announced. Two brothers are born in a deep and dark den. Wolf cub is three weeks old, and it's the first time he's seen the light of day. The youngster's curiosity is aroused by the smells and sounds coming towards them. The two brothers are ready for adventure, eager to go out and discover the world above. mother isn't there. There she is. Maybe they should have stayed in. They still don't realize that they are powerful predators. Like their mother, they'll never understand that herds of sheep are forbidden to them, that they frighten children for no reason, that some people would prefer them not living on French soil. But in spite of the fear they generate, the law is on their side. From the highest mountain tops to the inaccessible cliffs, survival strategies are invented everywhere. A prime example are the peaks of the Verdon Canyon. What could possibly survive on the vertical rock faces? Where moving around defies the laws of gravity. And yet, there's a surprising rare and little known animal living here. A tightrope walker with a perfect sense of balance the butterfly bird. This vertical life is the passion of Arnaud and Stephanie, both European leading climbing champions. During their ascension, they come across a variety of lives. Small flowers appear as if by magic, or this old Phoenician juniper bush. It's more than a thousand years old, and its roots grow deep and far under the rock. But their favorite sight, the one that fascinates them the most, is the butterfly bird, also known as the Dicodroma. It stands vertically thanks to the morphology of its feet, which are large with very solid curved claws and thumbs facing downward.
It's called the butterfly bird because it roams along the cliffs by opening its wings in fits and starts. Its wide wings enable it to take advantage of the rising currents and to reach the heights with a minimum of effort. Equaling the bird's lightness is a challenge for the two champions. But the challenge has its limits. Arnaud and Stephanie like to sleep above the emptiness below. Sleeping on the cliffs is like being suspended, momentarily out of time. The plains of Alsace and the Vosges mountain chain in northeastern France is a surprising region. In the autumn, geese arrive from northern Europe and cross France on their way to southern climates to spend the winter. For thousands of years, the adults have been guiding their newborn along these airborne routes. This family consists of a father, a mother and their six youngsters. The two adults fly ahead, and when one of them gets tired, the other takes over. The youngsters follow them. Since this is their first journey, they stick close to their parents and obey their slightest movements. They take advantage of the current and fly as if part of a platoon. The parents are not from the same species. The mother is a blue goose, whereas the father is a grey goose. Their offspring are therefore mixed. Some have the yellow beak of their father and the others their mother's pink beak. Things have not gone as smoothly as planned this year. A young female has been giving her parents trouble. She spends her time doing useless acrobatic movements when she should be saving her energy. The youngster refuses to do as her siblings do. Her constant lagging behind and falling out of formation is wrecking havoc within the group. Mother often has to put her youngster back on the right track. The parents use visual references including rivers, mountains and sometimes even our man-made roads to guide themselves. Tonight, they decide to make a stop at Lake Cruz. And of course, the young rebel does her own thing. The family will spend the night on the banks of the lake. Our family has been awake since dawn, but it's still too early to fly. They have to wait for the fog to lift. 
True to her independent nature, the young rebel leaves on her own to explore the surroundings, totally unaware of the danger. The family is ready to leave. The father is confident and gives a signal for departure. The sun rays are strong enough to create rising winds that will carry them along. At the other end of the lake, however, our young miss is beginning to realize that she can't hear the shouts of her family. They've left without her. What now? <laughs> Young geese don't have a migratory instinct. Without their parents to guide them, they have no idea where to go. Follow the water, fly up to the sky and hope to spot them. Call her mother in the hope that her cries will reach her. Heading southwest, the family has left on a long journey, crossing the plains and then soaring over the mountains, covering 300 kilometers in one day. The mother has just realized that she's forgotten her youngster. She's got to find her immediately. As she flies back to the lake, the father continues the journey with his young. He'll slow down the rhythm knowing that his companion will be joining him soon. The mother checks every part of the landscape. There she is. With one flap of the wings, mother and daughter are reunited. She places a youngster in her wake and redoubles her efforts, hoping to join the family before nightfall. There they are. Has the young rebel learned her lesson? Adult geese are extraordinarily patient with their young and confident as well. They never give up on them. The plains of Alsace are rich and fertile. Man has lived here for a long time on the banks of the Rhine, cultivating its hills. Just above these medieval villages, a medium-sized massive rises up, the Vosges. A sumptuous flora transformed this relief into a magic forest. Beech, oak, spruce and pine trees grow here in abundance, rivaling each other in terms of size. Some of these centuries-old trees can reach a height of 15 meters. It's a rich and protective habitat for a large fauna that enjoys the generosity of this forest. Another animal with a ravenous appetite lives in these forests. More discreet than the bear, but just as energetic. The badger is the most home-loving of mammals. Miss Badger lives here. Her life is organized with great precision. She wakes up at seven, takes care of a little business behind the big tree at 7.05, breakfast at 7.10, she cleans herself up at 7.15, followed by a tour of the property until eight o'clock. 
Although her schedule doesn't usually change, today an important project is going to disturb her routine. This morning, she feels the pressing need to start a family. Finding a Mr. Badger is therefore of vital importance, and she knows, since she's already picked up the scent, where to find a handsome male partner. But before choosing her lucky mate, Mrs. Badger has to find a home for her future family. Like any respectable badger, she needs a home with one main entrance and several secondary exits. More important, however, is finding the right terrain. And so, digging begins. This ground is too light. Better look elsewhere. Oh, sorry, madam. This might do. No, it won't do at all. And here? Not so great either. Ah, this looks just right. A high ceiling, visible beams. A fox has already done a good part of the work. This will be just fine. And Mr. Badger will help with the finishing touches. Miss Badger knows that a few respectable males live on the other side of the lake. What's important is to avoid a fickle, unfaithful male. Certain males accept the invitation willingly, only to leave the moment the youngsters are born. A male has left his odor as he passed by. Where's he hiding? In a universe of caves and labyrinths, one can search for weeks without finding one another. Ah, there he is. What's more, he looks like a hard worker. That's a good sign. He agrees. Miss Badger is happy. No, the house is on the other side of the lake. This way, Mr. Badger. Mr. and Mrs. Badger can now furnish their family home. To do so, they have to dig out 40 tons of earth to create galleries in several levels. Soon, five young badgers will be waking up at 7 a.m., doing their business at 7.05, breakfast at 7.10, cleaning up at 7.15. Going down towards the plains of central France, thousands of hectares of nature surround the spaces inhabited by man. Just outside of Paris, there's a forest whose beauty and unique nature attracted the kings of France for centuries. Fontainebleau is a royal forest. For 1,500 years, it has been protected by the kings of France. In this forest of oak, moors and desert sand, in these elusively shaped rocky masses, the world's royalty would come together to ride and hunt. Dogs have been through the undergrowth of this magic forest thousands of times. An incredible story has been perpetuated here for centuries. A story of complicity and rivalry between two kings. One often talks about inseparable deer, and it's true that two deer can spend their entire life together. These two 10-pointer royal males are a perfect example. The two friends are both seven years old and have been together since birth. The first deer is fearful, deeply worried, and spends his time waiting for danger. 
The second deer is careless and sometimes oblivious to danger. The fearful deer's ears can hear the slightest sound within a radius of 300 meters. The careless animal, however, has a quality he cultivates to perfection, his nose. He knows how to find the best food in any season, willow leaves and tender ivy. We can understand why these two deer form a couple. They warn each other of the danger and share the food they find. They are partners in everything and are never out of each other's sight. The deer have a territory they know by heart and a network of trails that they use all their lives and which cross our paths. These roots are transmitted from doe to deer, from generation to generation. The deer has been hunted by the wolf for thousands of years. To escape their highly organized packs, they have developed a number of tricks. Although wolves are coming back to France, the danger often comes from their descendants, dogs. The tricks, however, for escaping them are the same. Getting away from the pack as quickly as possible, but especially getting rid of the odor, which dogs can trace for hours. The odor spreads in the water and becomes imprecise. Even the sharp noses of the dogs are losing their trail. The deer have escaped the pack. The careless deer remains calm, but his fearful partner is still stressed out. And so, once again, they help each other. When it's time to rest, they find a well-protected hiding place to shelter. They spend the entire winter, spring and summer together. But with the changing of season comes the fateful moment of their lives when their story shifts dramatically. It's autumn. Their antlers have lost their velvet texture. Their coat has grown and turned black. A hormone in their body has multiplied a thousandfold. Testosterone. They can only think of one thing, the dust. Each deer approaches the herd from a different side. One through the plain, the other from the water. 
testing their power of seduction, mingling with the females to smell their fragrance. The squall stimulates the females' ovulation and activates their going into heat. From that moment on, sharing is impossible. The fearful one becomes fearless. Complicity is totally forgotten. Forcing the other to give up in front of the females. Those await the verdict. The fearful deer is the strongest. His bellowing rings out like a cry of victory. The careless deer surrenders. The females gather round their hero. He will mate with them for an entire month and prevent any new pretender from stealing his throne. His careless friend will remain alone, but when the first cold days of winter arrive, as if nothing had happened, the two friends will become allies once again for a new season of complicity. Wild animals have lived side by side with us for thousands of years, and they've had to adapt to our presence and our activities. Some are dangerous, but others can be beneficial. A great many animals have passed through Mary's hands. Ever since she was a child, when she recognized the calling, Mary has been coming to the aid of animals in need. Her reputation has gone far beyond the borders of her community. And as soon as an animal is in difficulty, it's she who is called upon. The most frequent animal wounds are from accidents with cars. For a variety of reasons, newborns and youngsters fall from their nests. Hunting is sometimes the cause as well. In the spring, she receives more than 120 species in her home, meaning up to 70 baby bottles administered per day. Mary's dilemma is that she has to provide affection to all of her convalescing animals. But this affection has to include getting them used to the presence of man, without doing too much since there's a risk of the animal becoming too attached to its human benefactors. Mary is like a surrogate mother, and a maternal relationship is created with each animal. The treatment she administers to the sparrows is the same for the youngsters. Warmth, constancy, and permanent attention. The little owls, with their golden eyes and their grumbling look, are very playful. They like to play hide and seek with Mary. Games like these create complicity. Most of the animals know how to call for Mary when they need her. In her presence, their innate fears vanish, and ironically, prey and predator make peace with each other. In Mary's opinion, the animals are receptive to encouragements, 
simply telling them, go on, hang in there, do it for me, gives them the strength to fight the illness. Animals are like us, she says, and if you encourage them, if you love them, if you motivate them, they'll make the effort. She feels that some of them even get better just to please her. But she doesn't want them to get too attached to her and forget their wild impulses. When an animal is back in good health, Mary needs all of her courage. Releasing them isn't easy. A part of Mary leaves with them. Giving back their freedom is Mary's special gift. On the Atlantic side of France, in the poitou charentes region, there's a very unique type of territory known as the Marais Poitouvin, a natural space shaped by man. 100,000 hectares of inundated land. Today, these spaces where seawater and freshwater come together have created an incredible ecosystem with a flourishing wildlife. Julian has been exploring these wetlands ever since his childhood, and he knows all its secrets. Julian is a living memory of this territory. His passion is to talk about the land in the manner of town criers of the past. This inveterate storyteller spreads the word about the wetlands to anyone ready to be charmed by its tales. He guides us through its meanders in order to discover the incredible stories of the wildlife living here. Part of the swampland is filled with water all year long, the Rosolière. In spring, all the creatures give life to a new generation. One of them requires a transformation reminiscent of a science fiction story to create its offspring. The dragonfly undergoes a metamorphosis. The small larva has spent more than a year under the water. Its perilous transformation will take place tonight. A high ground is required. Tonight, its life is going to change. The ugly aquatic larva is going to become the handsome emperor, Dragonfly. The liberation can begin. Sucking in the air and inflating its new body, its thorax breaks the envelope. It sheds its former skin. Its new feet come out easily, but the dragonfly can't use them yet. They're still too soft. No question of falling now. Wait for the feet to harden. The mutant is now in a totally vulnerable state. At last, its feet are ready. They're going to be able to grip its former head. Extracting the abdomen, the final step before leaving its former body. The young dragonfly deploys its new body. The wings and fur, humid and soft. 
Any movement could attract the curiosity of a predator. It's a critical moment. Suddenly, the miracle occurs. The wings are deployed never to close up again. In the early morning, it's finally ready. The dragonfly flaps its wings and reveals its attractive new appearance. Four independent wings on a perfectly aerodynamic body. The small aquatic larva that came out of the water last night has become one of the most sophisticated flying creatures in the world. No machine can come close to the perfection and dexterity of a dragonfly in flight. Soon, it will find a partner. And the cycle will begin again. When man first arrived here in prehistoric times, the site was an immense marshland invaded by insects. In the 12th century, communities of monks settled here and began the monumental task of drying up the swamps. They built dams to prevent the water from rising, dug canals to evacuate the rainwater, thus freeing the incredibly fertile soil. Agriculture and animal breeding prospered, giving these formerly hostile lands an unimaginable wealth. In a part of the marshes, Julia knows of an area left fallow by man and which has been taken over by animals. The ash trees which were once used for firewood have been abandoned. They have since been deployed, giving birth to a magnificent space. It's a secret spot that can only be seen from the sky. A forest where in spring one hears the shouts of a thousand youngsters. A nursery for colonies of herons, the Eronier. But although it's paradise for some, it's also the scene of tragedy for others. These fledglings are three weeks old and are constantly hungry. Their parents spend every day searching for food to satisfy their ravenous appetites. Something, however, is not right. One of the three youngsters stands back, while the other two devour everything their mother regurgitates. And yet, he's hungry too. Usually, the adults take three to four hour shifts, but the male and his family disappeared. So the mother is required to execute a constant aerial ballet to feed her young. She has to fly up to 30 kilometers to find fishing sites. Competition is fierce in the swamp. She's not the only one fishing for a family of four. The mother doubles her efforts for her three youngsters, but a struggle amongst the brothers has already begun. The two strongest siblings have joined together against the weakest. More frail and less active, he can only eat the leftovers. The problem is there aren't any. A single parent cannot possibly feed all three. Instinctively, they attack their little brother. It's not just a simple rivalry, but a fratricidal struggle for survival. The weakest of the three will die so that the other two can live, and there's nothing the mother can do to prevent it. The laws of nature can often be merciless. The best way to understand the complexity of this region is from the sky. 
The Marais Poitauvin is an extraordinary labyrinth of infinite number of canals. They drain the water towards the sea. This network of land arteries acts as a filter on the water that descends from the center of the country. The wetlands capture alluvia, treat it and cast clean, healthy water into the sea. These high quality waters are a godsend for the reproduction of the region's species. A great many birds come here to nest and to lay their eggs. But the countryside abounds with predators of all kinds. Frank is one of these. His passion is finding the greatest number of fledglings in a period of a few days. Frank, however, is a blessing for his prey. His mission for the Museum of Natural History is to give the young birds he finds an identity tag. He travels through the swamps from morning till night, looking for the most hidden areas. His objective is to protect those who have unknowingly placed themselves in harm's way. The short-eared owl nestles on the ground, and this tendency can often be fatal since they cannot tell the difference between high grass and a cultivated field. This species of owl is threatened with extinction. Frank's job is to alert farmers to the fact that beneath their feet they possess a real treasure. He asks them to be careful, not to cut the birds into shreds as they reap their crops. This knowledge and this reverence for life make each of us capable of preserving what lives next to us. More and more bird species nowadays live close to man because in our environment there are fewer natural predators. Without knowing it, we offer them our protection. The jackdaw is a small mischievous bird whose delicate odor Frank adores. For Frank, smelling the aroma of a bird is a way of capturing its essence while still allowing it to remain free. Thanks to people like Frank, millions of birds are identified every year, allowing to follow their migratory routes, making it possible to intervene in the event of an epidemic. Julian has other surprises in store for us. When night falls over the marshes, other creatures wake up and leave to go hunting. The rhinolophus bat is one of many species living in France. But for one of these bats, hunting is over for the day. She has to rush back to her colony's nest since the big moment has arrived. Tonight, she's going to give birth to her first infant. Like swallows, bats live under man-made roofs. Although rhinolophus bats prefer living communally, our future mother finds a more isolated space in order to give birth in privacy. The contractions have begun. The head appears first. The mother begins by cleaning her offspring. She licks it and frees its ears which were stuck to its head. The newborn is free and it descends naturally searching for her nipples. 
With her wings, she envelops and protects the youngster from a possible fall. The Massif Central, in the center of France, possesses numerous volcanoes eroded by time. Further south, we find the incredible diversity of the Cévennes region. The river water descending from the granite mountains have carved the contours of this calcareous region. Over time, the water has dug out canyons hundreds of meters deep. In recent years, an extraordinary animal has once again taken up residence on the cliffs of this region, the griffon vulture. It lives in colonies and is dependent on the actions of the group. The vulture has invented a collective strategy for finding its prey, a sophisticated procedure which is repeated every day. It's 6 a.m and the sun hasn't yet penetrated the depth of the canyons. Without the warm of the sun, the vulture cannot fly. In spite of its hunger, there's no question of moving yet. At last, the air can carry them. Like an air squadron, dozens of vultures take off. They gain altitude thanks to the warm currents. They can now fully demonstrate the exceptional talent of dividing up the territory. The large birds take their positions over several kilometers. They scan every inch of their hunting ground, but never lose track of the other vultures, for a very good reason. If one of them spots a prey, it immediately dives down after it. The other vultures haven't seen the prey, but they've noticed the absence of one of them. This means there's something to eat down below. In a matter of seconds, the entire colony gathers around for the feast. The work of one individual benefits everyone. Sharing is the price to pay for the colony's survival. Each bird can now return to its nest with a part of the treasure for its youngsters. The formidable work of vultures rids nature of corpses and their bacterial pollution, thus preventing the contamination of the water table. Thanks to them, these lands are now clean to the benefit of all the inhabitants. To the north of the Cévennes, the Lozère region, with its high plateaus, is lashed by the wind. Protestants took refuge here to escape being massacred during the great religious wars. This was once the scene of numerous combats of faith. In spite of its austere nature, it's here that the greatest number of rivers are born. One of the most famous takes its source on Mount Lozère the Tarn. During the first warm rays of the sun in the spring, the Tarn reaches its optimum strength.
Eric wants to challenge the river when it's at its most dangerous. But before measuring himself against its force, the extreme kayak racing champion wants to feel its currents. He wants to become one with the river and go as far as it will allow him. Eric knows that he can't fight its power. The slightest error is unforgivable. The force of the currents will crush, shatter and drown him. Eric experiences extreme pressure. During such moments, a feeling of completeness invades his spirit. His passion was born on this river, and ever since when spring arrives, he comes to pay tribute to it. The rivers cross and nourish the land, just as the blood in our veins nourishes our bodies. They are the country's precious treasures. The rivers of France have attracted a newcomer from a bygone era, the otter. With nostrils capable of fitting underwater, eyes that can change shape to adapt to different modifications of light, streamlined body, powerful web feet, and nasal hairs that enable the otter to detect the slightest movement of any underwater prey. The otter has a huge number of powers. Beauty, however, attracts jealousies. The otter's thick, soft and warm fur made it the victim of hunters in the past, who used the fur to clothe kings and queens. The otter reigns over 40 kilometers of river, When it leaves to hunt for food, this aquatic beauty can be terrifying. Everyone goes into hiding. If a fish sees an otter, it's already too late. If you see one, don't try to challenge it. The otter can remain underwater for eight minutes. An insect endemic to the Cévennes lives in the Lozère Mountains, the black bee. It has existed on our planet since prehistoric times, and yet it might have disappeared were it not for people who watch over it and protect it. This flower-loving insect is a workaholic. It works much more than necessary, in fact, which is what enables man to enjoy some of the honey it produces above all for itself. Eve is a very special kind of beekeeper, and his honey is famous for its aroma and its unique taste. Eve's ability for getting the best out of his bees stems from his thorough knowledge of their society and rules. His talents borders on alchemy. To house his bees, Eve builds them trunk hives 
which are imitations of their natural habitat. In these chestnut tree trunks, thousands of workers live around their queen. The black bee has a highly sophisticated sense of vision, reminiscent of advanced technology. Attracted by vivid colors, it looks for the nectar of the finest flowers, but on its return trip to the hive, to conserve its energy, it passes from color to black and white mode. A subtle moderation for the bee. When the scout detects an important source of food, it transmits the information to the hive. By a series of dances and gesticulations, it indicates the direction, the distance, and even the quantity of pollen available. This is how the pollen gatherers are recruited. To preserve the health of his bees, Eve practices a delicate operation every year. He creates a new swarm. He coaxes the old queen into entering the trap just above. As soon as she's inside, he can claim victory. The departure of the old queen provokes the rapid and spontaneous appearance of a very dynamic, very prolific new queen. But he also wants to preserve and protect the species and prevent the black bee from disappearing as a result of inbreeding with other bees. He therefore transports the old queen to a secret site where no other variety of bee lives. He won't take any honey as he allows these swarms to reorganize. In this way, the black bee species can be preserved. A bee lives for barely 30 days, becoming in turn a cleaner, nursemaid, builder, domestic and guardian. It's only after this entire series of initial tasks that the bee can become a nectar gatherer. Then one day, it falls to the ground, struck down by fatigue. Throughout its entire existence, a bee produces about seven grams of honey. To the south of the shores of mainland France lies an island of majestic beauty. From its mountainous barriers, extraordinary valleys, ravines and canyons, a legend recounts that the sun made such intense love with the sea that a child was born. Corsica. We're now in the Scandola Reserve. Dominated by the Dionese towers of Galeria, the cliffs plunge gracefully into the Mediterranean. Scandola is dedicated to the preservation of the island's natural land and sea treasures. This unique site has been classified UNESCO's World Heritage. The symbol of the reserve, the osprey, which almost disappeared here, is back again. Although Scandola on land is magnificent, it's under the sea that this reserve conceals its greatest treasures. To protect this exceptional heritage, one man has devoted his adult life for more than 30 years. Jean-Marie is the curator of the site. 
He has an appointment with a creature from the ocean depths. Each time he dives, as if it knew, the carnivorous creature rises from the abyss. But it does so without any warning. It chooses its hour. The fish here have no fear of man. They're not hunted, and we represent no danger for them. This herbarium is one of the Mediterranean's major ecosystems, an underwater prairie which provides nature with 20 liters of oxygen per square meter per day. Scandolo is a favorite spot for fish to spawn their eggs. The eggs laid here are carried by the current outside the limits of the reserve and nurture all the neighboring marine depths. All of these fish species will flourish and guarantee their presence on the country's coasts. There it is, waiting. The grouper is accustomed to living in a total safety at a depth of 100 meters. But in these protected waters, it has no qualms about swimming to the surface. Why does it systematically greet him? Is it really accustomed to this man in a bubble? Who are you? The love life of the grouper is one of the world's most surprising, to say the least. The grouper is a hermaphrodite. All young groupers are born as females and at the age of 10, change sex and become males. Males and females come together in early summer to reproduce. They dance and change colors as means of seduction. This is the outstanding nuptial parade of the groupers. The grouper almost disappeared from the Mediterranean coasts, but it once again reigns supreme thanks to reserves like Scandola. The Fango Delta is just a few hundred meters away from Scandola, a beach where fresh water joins the sea. In these natural ponds, a species of animal that has existed since the beginning of time flourishes, the cistude. It's the mating season, and this particular turtle has a curious seduction tactic. As a cold-blooded reptile before mating, it has to recover its energy thanks to the sun rays. Quickly, to the solarium. No time to lose before the crowd takes the best places. Oops, too late. This makeshift raft will do just fine as a deck chair. No, this is definitely not a good idea. Over there, an isolated female. The technique is quite simple, you see. Without her seeing, to take his mate by surprise and keep her head under water to prevent her from moving and breathing. No one in the colony seems to be shot in the least. The Sistu turtle is somewhat brutal, but that's how they reproduce. As soon as one moves away from the coast, this mountainous island becomes prickly and hostile, with a mackie of thick, sharp cutting and thorny bramble bushes. To survive in this vegetal barbed wire, one needs to be made of bronze and have an incredibly thick skin. The king of this terrain is the wild boar. 
Most wild boars live in groups and never separate. Certain individuals, however, have a fairly surprising behavior. This large male is a case in point. He's coupled with all the females, resulting in the birth of a great many young boars. Is he getting bored? Is he frustrated by the attitude of the sows which no longer accord him in a favor? Or is he filled with an irrepressible spirit of conquest? The male abandons his herd in search of adventure in other valleys. Equipped with the world's most extraordinary snout, the boar can distinguish odors on the ground left by other animals several days ago. A herd of boar came by here three days ago. About 15 individuals, lots of youngsters, mothers, and wait a minute, an uncoupled sow. Just what he needs. He's three days late, and in three days the group has covered a great deal of territory. His snout, however, can guide him over dozens of kilometers without the slightest wrong turn. The only thing that could make him lose the trail is the water. Has the female crossed the river? It's over there. Time to cross over. In spite of his hunger, the armored warrior continues his trek. Day and night, he stubbornly follows this invisible trail which brings him closer to his female with every passing hour. After two days without stopping, he senses his reward is near. There they are, the herd and the young female. That's definitely her. As if they understand each other with a sense of modesty characteristic of their species, the two animals join together to find a discreet sight, far from curious eyes. And now it's time for a nice bath. To coat the body with a thick layer of mud in order to eliminate any ticks that could sting and itch. The adventure he has just experienced has whetted his appetite. And he's ready once again to leave in search of new conquests. The sexual drive of these large solitary males has an important genetic function for the different boar populations. Thanks to these adventurous individuals, the wild boar herds will not deteriorate as a result of inbreeding. The gentleness of the climate and the fantastic Mediterranean location of Corsica have attracted a number of different populations throughout the ages. Some of them have settled in the mountains. In the commune of Anacor, the inhabitants have preserved the gestures of the ancestors. And animals other than wild boars travel long distances through the Corsican mountains. At the end of spring, when the sun's rays warm the earth, goats and sheep head naturally for the summits. The herds do not need anyone, not even the dogs that follow them, to reach the cooler climates of the mountains. Paul is their shepherd. He's been following them for 30 years. And when they decide to leave, he has to go. 
He leaves the village to spend five months at an altitude of more than 1,800 meters. After a day of climbing, the animals on their own find the pastures where they'll be spending the hot months. The summer can now arrive. An uncontrollable instinct flows through the veins of these animals. In the past, some sheep left for the mountains and became what they were before being domesticated by man, wild sheep. In the neighboring valley, the boar has finally found a herd with which he can enjoy spending time without having to head for the mountains. A few hundred kilometers away, the bear is looking for a winter den. He puts together a few branches and makes a soft downy nest in the shadow of the spruce trees. The deer are back together. The two rivals have forgotten their rivalry. A new year of complicity can begin. The vultures continue to look for a new treasure, which they don't have to share this time. The bat is now teaching a young to hunt. The two wolf cubs have become adolescents and follow their pack without fear of the lightning. The dragonfly has found a partner and will give birth to a new generation of dragonflies. The marmots take advantage of the last days of sunshine before their long hibernation. Mr. and Mrs. Badger have had an argument. They've decided to separate by mutual consent. The entire family have succeeded in crossing France from north to south. What remains now is to cross the high mountains. A final ordeal that requires all their strength. The difficulties of traveling have changed the attitude of the young rebel. Her parents sometimes even let her lead the formation. With enormous courage, these birds have been confronting the elements for thousands of years in order to survive and continue to feed our imagination. The geese will spend the winter in southern climes and return in the spring to once again soar above the fascinating lands of France.